What's good, everybody? Man is back. Big game, James. My dog, DDP. And we're back with Positively Relentless. And what's this? EP4? EP4? Yes, episode four. EP4? We've made, it a, we've made it a month now doing this. We, we made it much. a whole month. Yep. But the, here's the thing, dog. We talked about the last episode. Hopefully, the next time we talking, we're going to be in the Western Conference Finals. And guess what? That's what happened. That's going to start the main topic of the day. Of course, we're going to talk some Cowboys football like you know we do. The six-shirter might come out and hit you in the face. Bam, bam, bam. But okay. we're going to talk about these Mavs. We're excited. It's been a long time since we've seen these Western Conference Finals. The game is actually going on right now as we speak. Dinwiddie just hit a bucket, and he went crazy. We're going to talk about that game because he was the catalyst of the game. Talk about it, DDP, as they got that game seven in resounding fashion i said they was gonna shock the nba world on my twitter just by the way yeah no they they absolutely did i mean it it's something like home teams in game sevens win something like 81 percent of the time so it was already going against a difficult bet phoenix had the most home wins this year uh we we talked before about the other crazy stats for the suns not just that they were the one seed and pretty much the entire year were the one seed but also the fact that if they had a lead going into the third quarter it's over 53 nothing this year, 53 and 0 this year when leading going into the fourth. Doesn't matter if it's a hundred points or a single point, they're gonna beat you. And so I said, Dallas don't I don't care if it's one point, they just gotta have a lead. Well, they decided 40 was apparently a good enough lead because you don't see that. You don't see a team go on the road in a game seven and just beat the ever living crap out of a team that was pretty much the favorite the entire season to at least go back to the finals. It, it's an incredible thing. And yeah, Dinwiddie was huge. Dinwiddie, we kind of joked he just needed to still think it was game six because his two game sixes in the playoffs had been great. His other games had been very bad. It was like shooting threes was like 12 of 43 for him in games, not game six. But if it was game six, it was like nine of 12, like way, way better shooting in those two games. And he went off like he ended up with a 30 piece. Him and Luca both, I think Luca had 27 at the half match, the Suns entire roster, and Dinwiddie had like 21. He ends up with 30. Just an incredible game for Dallas, and you can't ask for anything more. And now here we are in the Western Conference Finals playing with house money, and you know what? Screw it. I want to get greedy with this house money. Go all in. Why not? I'm You're here earlier than you should be. Go all in because you ain't got nothing to lose. So my thing is don't go in there and just be like, oh, we're just happy we're here and just take it as that. No, go in there and like you said, like we playing with house money. Let's go in there and try to get this get this series and let's get to the finals. Let's not play around. Who cares? Let's not let's just go ahead and shock the NBA world. But just bouncing off what you were saying when this Phoenix game, this game seven. Uh, we've been talking about Spencer Dinwiddie, man, these first three episodes, we've been kind of just not down on them, but yeah, we've been down on them, but we've been saying it, it, it's got to happen soon. It's got to happen sooner or later. And it, and it, and it happened in the, in the perfect time. Like you said, he came out like game busters. I think Luca had 12 in the first quarter. He had eight. Yeah. The he first eight as well. Luca did. Exactly. And he was hitting three point shots, which he had been missing. He was two or three in the first quarter alone. And this this kind of compounded. Like I said, both those were the only three guys that were in double figures that game. And they took the majority of the shots. Yep. But it was kind of like him and Luca were the first half. And then in the second half, I was saying this is Jalen Brunson time after they had that nice little lead. And you saw Brunson kind of do his thing in the second half and kind of just, you know, get in that paint kind of take the hearts of the Suns. And I just love seeing uh, Devin Booker's face uh, all quiet and not saying too much and not doing all that Lucas special and all that stuff yep. because, buddy, he didn't play too good that game. Talk to me about that. Well, first, let me double on the Jalen Brunson thing. He had two at the half. He ended up with 24. Luca, um, Dinwiddie, and Brunson combined for 89 points. Phoenix ended with 90 as a team. So that that tells you everything there. But yeah, after Booker, after making the Luca special comment in game five late in the third quarter when they're up big, he, he imploded after that the rest of the series. He scored in like game six, like 10 points and then 15, I think, in game seven. Absolutely imploded, had nothing. And it was exactly what we said. He cannot lead a team by himself. When Chris Paul 
imploded in in his own right when his production dropped off the face of the earth after game two. And they're saying now Paul had a quad injury, but you never saw him limping until it was yeah, to the podium I after the season I ain't was over. That. I yeah. Ain't that. Yeah. So until that happened, you basically had a situation where it's like, all right, well, uh, Booker can't lead the team. If Paul's not going for them, then they got nothing they can do. I think Dallas just wore out Chris. We talked about how they were pressing him full court and how they were doing all this stuff to just make life hell for him every possession. They were attacking him defensively, basically saying, we're going to run, run you ragged every time you have the ball. And anytime you're on the court, we're going to attack you. We're going to make you work so that those 37-year-old legs feel every minute of that 37 years old by the time we get deep into this series. And it worked. It absolutely worked. And Booker does not have the ability to carry his team beyond that. So they ran out of gas, and Dallas got to advance. You know what? We'll, we'll get into this a little bit here in the, uh, this next segment as we talk about the four teams remaining now. I don't think... Now, Golden State's a tough matchup, but I don't think there's any reason to believe that Dallas hasn't already faced the toughest matchup it could have had. It, like, Phoenix is a damn good team. And people want to say, like, oh, well, maybe the Jazz weren't that great because look how Dallas fleeced them, including going up 2-1 without Luka. <laughs> what was wrong with the Jazz? They weren't what we thought they were. And people said, oh, Phoenix, what frauds, what posers. What about the common denominator in all of this? The Mavericks were who they faced. Why not take a look and actually consider the possibility that maybe this Dallas team is just really good. Maybe they brought it and what they were doing defensively, just as they've done all year, frustrated and bothered them. And with how Phoenix spaces the floor and everything, it actually plays right into Dallas's defensive hands. Like their scheme was a perfect counter to how Phoenix usually spaces the floor. That's going to be a challenge in this next round because the Warriors are the best team in the West as far as spacing out their offense. But that's a different story. Phoenix was a very tough matchup, one that is a much more talented, deeper roster than Dallas. Dallas didn't care. Dallas went out with a perfect strategy. And as long as they executed, they punched him in the mouth. and They beat them down game after game. It's a statement, but nobody wants to consider it that yet. Hey, well, like I said, it was a statement. A lot of people didn't give Dallas a chance, and they cannot say what they want. There wasn't a lot of people that were picking the Mavericks. Um, but, you know, once uh, – and even when it dropped down to 0-2, everybody pretty much gave uh, the us the white flag and said it was over. Yep. Uh, but cr uh, credit to Jason Kidd and his staff for continuing to keep this team the way it is. Um, we saw since um, after December when they were lost their little way – um, they've been Dallas has been one of the best teams in the NBA record wise, and it is just continuing to go into the uh, playoffs and they're deep in the playoffs, especially with kids first year. So to me, like I told you before, uh, DDP, I always like Jason Kidd. I know he lost his way a little bit in Milwaukee and things of that nature, mm -hmm. uh, but I always liked him as a player. You know what he did in Dallas. I always liked him. I liked him as a coach. I thought he would be a good coach, um, you know. Uh, and I was wondering about how this fit would happen. Uh, but I think kid still has that. Um, what am I trying to say? He has that ear to the streets, the yep. basketball streets more than like a Rick Carlisle. Mm -hmm. I feel like Rick Carlisle maybe might be a little more out to date than kid might be more into date with these younger players, maybe can relate a little bit more. And then that maybe gets a little more out of them. Um, and he gave uh, Jalen Brunson a lot more freedom this year. And you saw what Jalen Brunson has done with it. Um, so just credit to him. And um, just checking out this game, it's uh, first quarter is over 28-18. Uh, Warriors kind of, um, you know, they're bringing it. You know, you were bringing up the Warriors and the four teams that were left, especially, mm -hmm. specifically the Warriors. One thing I noticed, like I said, DDP, you said they should, uh, you know, it should be okay as far as dealing with this matchup. One of the things I'm kind of concerned about in this matchup, like I said, is the tempo and the pace um, and how they're really trying to guard Jalen Brunson. I feel like they're going to, Dallas is really going to have to jump out here and make this adjustment uh, because it looks like they're coming out and saying it's not going to be Jalen Brunson going to the hole and getting them little shots, kind of getting the Dallas kind of in the game. Um, they're letting him shoot the three pointer because he's not the greatest three pointer shoot three point shooter um, to me. Mm -hmm. um, so what's your kind of thoughts with, you know, go and say what I just said with the tempo, you know, they got Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, they shoot a lot of three pointers, but they got guys that can go to hole. And I think pool is going to be a big factor uh, because he can't get to the hole and he has good size. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, don't get me wrong. This is a very good Warriors team, right? Like, they were good all year. They really faded late in the year while Curry was out. Um, but it, it wasn't so much that they worried about their seeding so much. Like, at times, they were the two seed for much of the much of the year. They ended up as the three, but they had to kind of climb back into that three spot later in the year. But it's not... This isn't the Warriors dynasty, right? Like, if you go off of the the Warriors without Kevin Durant, their last championship was 2015. 2011, the Mavericks last championship in 2015, that's a shorter gap between those than the Warriors 2015 title and today. Like, it's been a minute since the Warriors, without Durant, have won a championship. And they're a very good team, but they're a different look than they are now. They're, they're not the young up-and-comers. Uh, you've seen Steph at times coming off the bench in the postseason. Like, they're doing a good job mixing it up and how they're implementing him. Poole has been very good for them as well. But I don't know that they've had to be tested so much yet. Like, yeah, they went up against the MVP, um, Jokic, in the first round. But I didn't, I didn't think that was a great Denver team. Uh, Jokic is great. I just didn't think it was a great Denver team by the time the postseason arrived. And then the, the Grizzlies, they, Grizzlies were great without Jaw all year. Like, they were, what, like 23-4 and four without Jaw? Like, that's absurd. Um, which, by the way, how do you get rookie of the year and then most improved player the next year? That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. But uh, <laughs> but even with that, it's like, okay, but then you dealt with that series without Jaw. You, in game six, was it game six or no? It was game five uh, when they basically called their, their closeout for the series. They got routed in Memphis. And then in game six, they had to scratch and claw just to kind of put that series away. And again, without the best player on the Grizzlies. That's... I just don't think they've been tested in the same way Dallas has had to be tested. And if there's fuel in the tank, I think that's for Dallas. This is what I was saying uh, in my video the other day. If Dallas has fuel in the tank, it's damn clean burning fuel because it's very efficient. It's battle tested. It is good to go. Whereas the Warriors, it's kind of been sitting there a while. They haven't really had to tap into those reserves. And so you kind of wonder, um, can they kick into gear and sustain it? What's one thing to, to note with the Warriors? Um, this, is a, this is a stat I got earlier this afternoon from Mark Followell. The Warriors uh, in Game 1s under Steve Kerr are 20-2 and two in Game 1 of a series. Not at home. Game 1 of a series. 20-2. Uh, 2016, maybe it is. I actually think that is a home stat. Let me clarify that. 20-2 and two at home in Game 1s under Kerr. The losses are 2016 to OKC, a series they fell behind 3-1 and then came back to win, uh, and 2019, the finals versus Toronto. The Warriors have won at least one road game in each playoff series dating back to Mark Jackson as head coach. Translation, they have home court, they don't lose game one, and Dallas is going to have to still find a way to win one in Golden State no matter what. Maybe win two because... Statistics and trends show Golden State's going to find a way to steal a game on the road. They've done it every series dating back past Steve Kerr's tenure. Like, that's, that's an unreal stat to me. That shows dominance at home and uh, just utter grit and resolve on the road to at least steal one to kind of counteract that balance. So either you got to hold your home court and find a way to steal one, or you're going to have to find a way to take two in Golden State knowing there's a good chance you don't win game one, which they're down 10 uh, right now. And Dallas has been bothered. So it's going to be a real challenge. I don't know how Dallas is going to answer it. It's the first time for them in the Western Conference Finals since 2011. But I also know I'm not betting against this team. Like This team has surprised all, really since December, January, has consistently surprised. Still some people are starting to wake up to how good they might be, but you still have the majority of people doubting them. And this team shows that that fuels them. They don't let that go unnoticed. They take the disrespect and then they go shove it in everyone's face. And I love that. That's the right attitude. Well, I think it's the coach. I mean, the team, the team takes on the personality of the coach, in my opinion. And if we look at Jason Kidd, he was that type of player, in my opinion. He didn't back down from anybody, and he brought it to you. And he always stood up for a challenge. So I think it's just morphed into what the coach has uh, said, and and I and I like that attitude as well. Um, but uh, you know, in this game, like I said, uh, you know, 
watching, you know, two players are going to have to be huge. We know what Luke is going to bring to the table. And we've seen Brunts. So we can count on them, too. But we're going to keep on saying that supporting cast, especially Dinwiddie, mm-hmm. uh, because he has the ability to play. Um, he can create his own shot. Um, and I think that's key, especially in this series, uh, because, as I said before, a bullet just scored on a play. We Dallas has to be able to get into that paint and be able to score. Yep. Um, I don't want, you know, just like you said, they were a lot uh, more sh- a three point shooting team last year, mm-hmm. but they still they still crank them up. And like I said, right now, I think they're only shooting like 18 percent from three point range already trucked up like 22 or 23 18 percent right now for the Mavericks from three. 27% 14. from the field, yeah. So, so you see the the three-point shooting, if it's not there, those two guys in particular, because Reggie Bullock, he doesn't really drive to the hole and doesn't neither does Smith, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Those are the two penetrators besides Luca, and they got to find a way to continue to get into that paint, especially Dinwiddie. I think he's got to get in there and hit that mid-range jumper, uh, not go too deep, but hit that mid-range jumper. If you can continue to do that and keep Luca rested, uh, because what I've noticed off, off rip, um, they were letting Brunson hold uh, uh, run the point more uh, than Luca. Uh, because I feel like they don't want to wear him down because it's going to be a fast paced series. Yeah. I mean, th- this is, it's the Dallas's best lineup thus far has been small ball. We, we've talked about the struggles of their front court, the limitations, whether it's rebounding or inside scoring Dallas, you mentioned how the warriors are really hedging on some of these screens and they're trying to keep them out of the paint. That's because Dallas's game is driving dish, like get into the paint and kick it to the open shooter as the defense collapses. That's Luca's, bread and butter that's how he serves up a potential like 20 assists every game and they're not letting them into the paint they're hedging hard which means dallas has to hit the slip screen or they have to set up some kind of action on the back end um to counteract that and it's not really not really coming together yet and what's troubling here is the warriors look like the team playing with energy they're in front of their home crowd that helps but they're shooting 60% from the field, Dallas below 30%. Uh, they're out-rebounding re- out Dallas 20-13 to 13 early on, and it's mostly defensive boards, but that just tells you Dallas is one and done on their possessions, and the Warriors, meanwhile, are finding a way to get a little bit of offensive glass. And that's, that's all the kind of stats, the hustle stats, if you will, that Dallas needs to find a way to win because, yes, Your bread and butter might have been small ball up until this point, your three guard lineup, which they haven't run yet in this game, Um, but your three guard lineup, that's lethal. But the Warriors are one of the few teams that like not, you know, they're they're the kind of small ball architects, right? Like Mm. they'll roll Draymond at the five. You'll have Poole, Steph, um, Clay, and Wiggins out there. Like that, you'll run that five guard or that five uh, for them. Dallas is going to counter with probably the three guards we know, Finney Smith mm-hmm. and Maxi. He's he's kind of a forward slash center, like he really is more of a four than a five. So that's probably Dallas's counter punch. And like pound for pound, you I think you obviously say the Golden State thing, even though you got three of those guys up there in age. I think for Golden State, the biggest X, X factor is probably Draymond because. Draymond, because of what they're surrounded with in terms of shooters and how he kind of plays that point forward for them at times, you can't really just bag off and force him to shoot because then he's just going to do a handoff with Curry who's just going to pop a three right behind him, right? Like, it's not that you're having to sag off of Draymond. It's that you're having to sag off of the action he's going to create. So that's, that's a challenge that complicates Dallas. And obviously we know he's a physical, tough defender, very versatile. Also not opposed to throwing a kick in the nuts or football tackling Steven Adams to the ground. But that's just that's just the unique challenge here. If Draymond can have a big series for them and frustrate whether it's Luca or whoever he's gonna match up with, this could be tough for Dallas. But I also feel like Dallas Luca has played historically very well against the Warriors. I think he's 10 and 4 in his career against them, including when they had Durant. And his averages in the those 10 wins is like 33 points. In the four losses, it's like 24. So more often than not, his points per game against Golden State, I think, is the fifth highest of him versus any team in the league. And the other four are all teams that are perennial lottery teams. So 
that that does mean something. What exactly? I don't know because the playoffs are different. But I feel like that means something. But you got to get those other guys. You got to get Brunson. You got to get Dinwiddie, and uh, you got to find a way for your role players to come through. You got to make some plays. Can't just be Luca. No, definitely not. Can't just be Luca. And I uh, really just got to weather the storm right now. Uh, you know, it's going to see that. Um, but uh, you know, right now in my heart, man, I just wish Jalen Brunson was like about six four. <laughs> like yeah. it's about six four, six five, man. If he just had a couple more inches, man, he's so devastating when he's getting in a hole. But you know, they're they're switching like a Kevin Looney on him to try to have have him deal with length. Uh, but he's still able to get in there. But we'll see how it kind of goes. Um, like I said, Dallas has got a weather storm. You just came out and brought up that tremendous stat with Golden State in game one at home mm -hmm. um, and what they look like. So it's going to be a tough game one. And you see they're they're excited. Um, you know, they, they're they excited. They think they can get back to the, the final since it's been a very long time for them, especially with this team. Uh, I don't know if a lot of people were talking about Golden State about getting to the finals. So, um, you know, we'll just kind of see how this series goes. But as I said before, Dallas has just really got to just weather the storm. Yeah. And for me, the good thing about I feel good about this game still is that you just mentioned that Golden State was shooting about 60 percent uh, from the field. Dallas was shooting in uh, under 25, uh, you know, under 20 percent three point range mm -hmm. yet. Uh, they're still Within only six. down six points. Yep. That 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 makes you feel good. And that's the thing, too, is Dallas's uh, defense. You saw the the I'm, sh I'm guessing you saw the clip of Jason Kidd mic'd up on the sideline and everything mm -hmm. uh, in game seven against the Suns. Man, when you got that kind of intensity and like it's not intensity like intimidating, but like yeah. it's passion. And I think it's absolutely something like how many people watch that and we're like, Dude, I'm fired up. I could run through right, a brick wall. Right I, 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 I wanted to get up and play, dog, because yeah. I remember I remember coaches doing, hey, jump up, get up, get over there. Yeah. I, no, that's how I do it. So I, I love it. I love every minute of that. Yeah, you can feel his want in it, and the players are responding to that. He has a, a great feel right now for the pulse of this team. He's pushing every right button, and he's getting absolutely the max out of these guys that, no disrespect to Carlisle, he just couldn't get out of these guys anymore. Like, in the last few years of Carlisle, we had – almost every year, at least one player only meeting. And I just think he could not connect with the players at that level. Can, anymore. Can relate. Yeah. All the mm -hmm. championship guys were gone and it kind of just was like, yeah, but stale. What, yeah. What, what have you done <laughs> since, since the title? And yeah, stale. You know, I think, I think Rick's a good coach, but yeah, once, once you're too out of touch, too out of the loop, mm -hmm. it eventually causes an issue. And I'm not trying to say Jason Kidd is Mr. Hip and connected. Obviously you remember his, uh, introduction press conference and everything he's joking mm -hmm. about oh kids today got this thing called texting i'm like mm -hmm. jason that was probably around in 94 in some capacity when you came into the league. like right, if you had right. said like instagram or tiktok or something like that then i would have been like yeah okay no that's that's whatever but i don't know it, it's that's neither here nor there that's not obviously what he's bringing to the mm. thing it's more just his ability to connect with the team and get a response out of them and i think he's done a great job of that so now Luca's holding his shoulder. I don't like that. I don't know. Sorry. Oh, no, you're I good. Hold, I seen him holding his shoulder. I was like, hey, Did you see the I don't scratch like on his face already. Oh man, he got told yeah. told us from the floor up. Yeah, but people still want to say that he never gets fouled and that he just flops every time. <laughs> but now that uh now that we're down to the final four, uh mm -hmm. now that Boston has dispatched Milwaukee in game seven. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who do you think at this point would be the favorites in the in the final four here? Who's the favorite to win the championship? Ooh, favorite to win a championship. Number I was, one Miami. Uh, I would say the Miami Heat. Okay, yeah. That's the one one seed left. You got number one Miami, uh, number three Boston, number three Golden State, and number four Dallas. So Yeah, I would, I would say Miami. Yeah. I would go with them. And, you know, it's interesting, too, because the Heat have been very good all year, but it's also it's also one of those things where I kind of question a little bit. Um, I think they're good. I don't think they're great. I actually... No, they're take, not great. I would actually take Boston over them. I picked Boston. Yeah. But I feel like they're still... I mean, if you go all the way down to it, I think defensively, um, I don't, I, you know, Jimmy Butler, Bam... I, I I like that. Uh, I, you know, I picked the Celtics in, in six uh, yep. because of Tatum. 
I feel like, you know, if he continues, but, you know, it was a big loss for them losing uh, Smart and Horford. I think that was a big difference. Yeah, uh, health because and safety they were protocols bang. is going me? to be a real concern for them because apparently they had multiple people in their traveling party test part, uh, positive in the last exactly. few days, and now they're suddenly worried there might be more guys that go out. And mm-hmm. uh, you mentioned Smart. I think he has a foot issue. So that's that's mm-hmm. unrelated. That's a bigger deal. But, yeah, that's that's very true. Um you know, if Dallas could slip by Golden State, mm-hmm. you could have the symmetry of Dallas Miami three, but like the new era of it, where mm-hmm. it's not Wade, it's not LeBron, it's not Dirk, it's Luca and Butler, which would be very yeah. Intriguing. That that you know Butler's taking that matchup. Yeah, <laughs> that would be very interesting to see. That would be real good. Um, but here's the thing: there is there is a cool symmetry as well. If it's um. There's a cool symmetry as well if it's Boston because Boston's trajectory this year is almost identical to Dallas's. They struggled through the first couple months of the season. They were sitting game or two under 500 right around the same time Dallas was and turned it around. They climbed because Dallas ended up with a better record, but Boston in the East is the three seed instead of the four like Dallas was in the West. But here's, here's the thing. If these teams, if Boston and Dallas did advance, Dallas would have home court because they have the better record. It doesn't matter that the Celtics are the three seed in the East. That's that's pretty huge. Huge, because yeah, Luca has not lost at home yet this postseason. Dallas's one loss at home was game one against the, the Jazz when it was Brunson and Dinwiddie have, having to lead the charge. They lost by nine. So that's pretty telling as Dallas cuts the lead to three here. Um, that's pretty telling. And I really think, you know, not to get ahead of ourselves at all. Again, Golden State's a very good team. I don't think they're the juggernaut by any means they were before, but I think that they're a well-coached team. They still got guys that can turn it on and still pour it on. I don't know if they can sustain it in a long series. Maybe to that effect, it helps that they hadn't really had to be tested yet. But I don't know. I, I feel like mathematically, Miami is probably the favorite. Boston might have that bump just because they took down the Bucks, who I would have said was the best team left had they be- beaten Boston. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I-, I feel like more than likely it's kind of a toss up between Boston and Miami. Miami really t- uh, tore them apart in game one. So that's, I guess, an indicator there maybe. Uh, and in the West, I really do think this is this is pretty open for Dallas. Luca has always put up big numbers against the Warriors, um, and Dallas's record overall against the Warriors has been strong in the last two or three years. So the Warriors not really having the front court thing to bo- kind of bother Dallas that could help them or it could hurt them. You know, like they're gonna Dallas's small ball lineup is gonna be kind of mandatory for them to play because the Warriors are also gonna run it. And it's like, well, if there's anyone who knows how to small ball, it's going to be Golden State. So you could have trouble there, or you could say, all right, hey, we're going to have to roll out our best lineup anyway, and it's just going to be if we can outdo them. And largely, can Luka outplay? I don't even think it's just as simple as outplaying Curry at this point in his career, because I think Curry peaked last year when he nearly won MVP um, for Golden State last year. I think at this point, He's still very good, very dangerous, but I don't think he's, you know, MVP peak Curry anymore. Luca's got to be able to be head and shoulders the best player in the series again, like he was against Phoenix, where you could take his stats and he had more points than Devin Booker, more assists than Chris Paul, more rebounds than DeAndre Aiden, more steals than Michael Bridges. Like if he's able to do some nonsense like that, then I think Dallas is hard pressed to bet against them. Yeah, well, we're about to see, dog. Uh, the main thing I'm going to say in, in, in finishing out what we talk uh, with this series with these uh, Warriors Mavs is just to keep an eye on uh, Luca has been holding his shooting shoulder, shooting um, arm, hand, whatever you want to call it, keeps digging in the shoulder. Uh, so that's just something to keep your eye on moving forward. We hope it's nothing major. I um, hope it's just something like just minor, that. It, uh, but I have noticed that he kept doing it. Um, pretty much a lot of the last two or three minutes of this second quarter. So that's just something to look at going in 
to halftime uh, with the Mavs and Warriors. Yeah, he's. I mean, he's hustling on defense. He's really getting after them and trapping. So nice play by Golden State. Good ball movement. Um, yeah, he's still playing hard. Like he's not looking passive on defense. And I feel like if it was something concerning, you would see a little bit of passivity on that end. Yeah, Golden mm-hmm. State's a, a good defensive team, no doubt. A step back three. Mm. Yep. Yeah, so. Uh, let's move now into a little bit of Cowboys talk. Let's roll into some Cowboys six shooter. Mm-hmm. So we got a few uh, few topics here. I know you've been talking uh, a little bit of Cowboys rookie mini camps. Uh, mm-hmm. Who the standouts are there? Sounds like the first round pick is uh, actually living up to the billing. If you listen to the people really around the team right now, tell me a little about that. I mean, a lot of people are feeling good about Tyler Smith. Uh, listen to Dave Hellman. He was on Skywalker Steel show and just listen to a few people in the Cowboy streets uh, basically are saying that, you know, um, they're surprised. They, they, you know, they, they were pleasantly surprised at what Tyler Smith was bringing to the table uh, and was keeping his arms in. Uh, didn't see a lot of the, you know, uh, didn't see a lot of technical issues. Um a lot of things are still going to be worked out. We saw that he played left tackle, so he's still learning a lot of things. He even said himself he's learning things because he hasn't played left guard since 2018. Yeah. Um, so, you know, he's he's growing into it. Uh, but the thing that a lot of people say in the building is that he is physical. He wants to learn. He wants to get better. Uh, if you listen to a lot of his interviews, he's always saying, hey, I'll do whatever they want. I'll do whatever they need. You know, he's very um, open uh, to, you know, uh, learning, um, soaking in knowledge. I feel like he's going to be around the Zach Martins and those type of guys because he has the want to. And I think that's the biggest thing, DDP, more than anything, uh, because he has talent. He has the size. Mm -hmm. It's just really got to learn the technical things, but it's the want to. When you got a player that's coming in saying, I'll do whatever, I I just want to be the best, and you really watch him and you can kind of, you believe what he's saying, like he's from Texas. I told you, that means a lot. Uh, When you're playing from your hometown and you play for the Dallas Cowboys, it's personal. Um, So he doesn't want to let anybody down. Um, So I feel like there's a lot of positives with him uh, in particular. Sam Williams is another guy that, like I said, I liked him from the beginning, um, you know, and Dan Quinn said once he met him, he said, this is a guy I want to coach. And, you know, from the, what everybody's saying in the building is he's everything as advertised as far as athletic ability. Um, you know, he can he can, you know, bring it off the edge. He's a full 265 pounds. He's six foot three, 265. Uh, we saw he ran the four or five in the 40. Um, mm-hmm. He's every bit of athletic that they're saying, strength, athleticism. Um, Demarcus Lawrence was doing some after uh, stuff drills with him. Um, so you're feeling real good about that. You lost to Randy Gregory, but if you can come in and this rookie can come in and really can contribute early, you're feeling good about that. So it's a lot of good positive about those first two draft picks uh, coming into rookie minicamp. I mean, that's definitely good. I, I guess I always take a, a grain of salt with rookie mini camp stuff because especially with kind of the, the off season this team has had and negative press and everything, it feels like hype can be a little bit pumped up, you know, kind of like, ah, I, I know people were still unsure of our draft, but hey, that, that, uh, that somewhat controversial pick we took in the first round, ah, he's balling out. He looks like he might really be something special immediately. And he might be, but it's just one of those things that I, I kind of wonder, like, all right, well, let's see how he's doing in training camp. Because, I mean, we've seen stuff where guys, now this is more in training camp itself, but we've seen guys who start out looking like superstars, borderline in, in start at camp. And then by the end of camp, it's like, man, you fell off and we're in training camp. Like, imagine if it was the, the season, what the, the drop off would be. You know what I mean, like, mm-hmm. uh, I guess that's it. It's just, I'm glad to hear that they're showing promise and that, the things that they said they liked about these guys, they're seeing that translate in rookie minicamp and everything. That's great. I'm just going to reserve any judgment until we get at least halfway into training camp before I start to kind of buy into like, okay, they got another one or two guys that'll make a real impact for them in this upcoming year. You know, like Micah set the bar, the bar rather high. Uh, it's tough to, to tough to match that. Not that they have to match that to be considered a successful pick, but it's just one of those things where that's almost like 
because of that, you're going to have people who look at it and say like, oh yeah, no, he's fine. But you know, Micah was awesome. It's not as good as the Micah pick. And it's like, there's a reason there's not many guys like that. <laughs> They're not generally floating out there, let alone where Dallas was picking for them to get Micah in the first. Well, I mean, see, I mean, that's the problem. The problem was the main problem is that Sam Williams, D Sam D Williams, whatever he wants to call himself, he looks like Michael Parsons. So right there, that just really messed everything up in my opinion. Cause everybody, like, oh, Michael Parsons, he looked just like him. Yeah. You know, and, and he's athletic. He ran a four or five. So of course now they're gonna have these comparisons. Make to his him. number like 10 or something or 19, yeah, so it or I mean, 17. So it looks like Parsons jersey as well. Yeah. I just feel like, you know, just kind of oh, look at the three. But I just kind of feel like, you know what? Just let him be him. Stop yep. making the compar- comparisons. Let him just play ball. You feel me? Don't let him just kind of, you know, just let him kind of find his own way because Dan Quinn has got a plan for him. That's yep. what I love about Dan Quinn because he always has a plan. He has a plan for him. So I'm sure when he met him or he had him in that pro day, he already had a specific plan for Sam D. Williams, just like he had a plan for Michael Parsons. He has a plan for each specific player. And that's what I really like, what he's going to bring to the table. So I'm going to tell you right now, dog, I ain't believing none of the hype. You know what I'm saying? I'm not believing not in no we had the show the other day. I'm not drinking a Kool-Aid. Mm-hmm. I'm not believing none of the hype. But if we're talking about maybe the attitude of the players, I will say from what I've seen, I don't know so much Sam Williams, uh, but I will say with Tyler Smith, I do see positivity as far as I like his attitude. And if they are getting players that they want to have that more attitude, the nastiness, the mean streak, the t- the players that are all in, because that's what Mike McCarthy wants. That's why a Jalen Smith was let go. That's why you saw a little bit of change in the way because he wants all in players. Mm-hmm. So I feel like this is an all in guy. So that's a good positive for me. And if he can be nasty on the field, that's only going to help Dallas because they have a glaring need at left guard. Yeah. So let's talk veteran options. What's who's out there still that can make a real contribution to this team. Obviously we know the one name. Um, you know, I don't think the Dallas Cowboys are really going to jump anywhere else. I feel like this is the, you don't think they they're going to look at bar. Um, no, I, I I didn't know if you were just talking about Bar. Oh, no, I thought I, you were I meant, talking like, about include him, but like okay, I, I was okay. also asking if there was any other names. No, I don't really think. I'm, I mean, I've been scouring. When I look at the team as a whole, as the makeup, uh, we were talking receivers. The one other person I I, I like was Jarvis Landry. You saw him sign with the Saints. He got a yep. base salary of three million dollars. Yep. So it's something Dallas could definitely afford. But I feel like you know they keep on coming saying we like our room, we like our guys. They, they really like our guys. All right, you, we stay, I mean, we hear it time and time be on again. Their tombstones, they exactly. Like our guys. Exactly. But, you know, they like Jalen Tolbert, you know, they're, they're saying, uh, you know, good things about him. So I feel like he can come in and they're going to try to push him to come in and be that uh, number two receiver while Michael Gallup is out. So I feel like they're not going to touch a veteran receiver. Uh, Anthony Barr, like I said, that makes sense because they are lacking in the linebacking core. You still have guys in a, I mean, guys in the second year. Michael Parsons, he's in, he's in his second year. He's mm-hmm. still learning the game. If you feel what I'm saying? Jabar, yep. uh, Jabril Cox, he's coming off the ACL injury, so he's still rehabbing. Luke Gifford has only been a special teams player. You got LVE. He has been. He was healthy for the first time in like a very long time. But you can't really put a lot of stock in LVE like he's going to be right. a difference maker. You can see what I'm saying. Or so stay you healthy. still or stay healthy. Damone Clark. He's not going to be playing until possibly maybe midseason, if all all year. And then you got Harper, who I like from Oklahoma State, but he's a six round draft pick. Mm-hmm. So for me, I think you need to add an Anthony Barr because you need a veteran, you need depth, and you have a guy who's familiar with the program. He was with Minnesota. He dealt with Edwards, so there's already a common a, a connection right there. There's already a familiarity. They love size. He's six five. He's two sixty. And like I said, he's savvy. If one of these guys go down with the Cowboys, I feel better with Anthony Barr playing in the game than them getting some guy we don't know anything about and Dallas start getting gas. So I think that's the one thing that makes sense. I don't see it where else they go. Safety, they they sold up Malik Hooker and they got uh, J. Ron Curse back in the fold. Yeah. I feel like every everything is good in the cornerbacks. So I just feel like if they're going to touch anything, DDP, DDP, besides linebacker, it would be, to me, it would be an offensive lineman. Okay. What about uh, what about some of the undrafted free agents? Is there anyone there you think could make the squad? It seemed like Dallas had a pretty good run on some of those undrafted kids and got some nice names that were still floating out there. But do you think any of them can actually make the team or bring much to it this year? Uh, 
I, I would say I don't know about this year, but I definitely feel like some people can definitely make the roster. Practice squad really, and stuff. Uh, yeah, definitely, uh, definitely practice squad candidates who I definitely feel unless they just play terrible or have a major injury. Um, Alec Lindstrom, the center from Boston College, they're feeling really good about him. The center's position is still unsettled. Yeah. So you never know what can happen with that. I know they really liked uh, safety Marquise Bell from Florida A&M. They were talking about drafting him, but he fell in their laps being undrafted. So I definitely feel like he has a chance because even though they are set at safety, I know they still want to groom people in the safety room. Mm -hmm. So I feel like he definitely has a chance. Uh, the linebacker, I haven't really seen a lot of him. I'm going to have to check the tape on him. But linebacker Story Jackson from Liberty, hearing a lot of good things about him, really active, a sideline to sideline guy. And a personal uh, guy that I like, two receivers I like, Dante or drummer from Ole Miss, but one I in particular I like is Ty Freifogel from Indiana. I think he he doesn't really offer in the special teams, which you have to play some special teams to really make a roster now, DDP. Mm -hmm. But he has pretty good size. He's not a fast guy, but he's a guy that can get open. So he's a guy that you can really let and really manipulate the slot. And coming into 2021, he was one of the receivers they were talking about as being one of the top receivers. He just didn't have the season that he would have liked or he didn't look like he was really there. But if you look at his 2020 season, he had some really good, strong games. And I like his chances, especially if he can play some special teams. Nice. Uh, all right, so last three here. Let's go a uh, little up-tempo. Uh, which rookie from this class do you think has the biggest impact on whether uh, you think I'm, it's the top pick or whoever just has the opportunity? That's going to be tough That's because mm -hmm. I look at Sam Williams, Jalen Tolbert, and Jake Ferguson. But for some reason, I said this before, and I'm going to just jump out there, Jake Ferguson. A lot of people are hyping him up. He got the number 48. Um, I really liked his game at the Senior Bowl, so I'm going to go ahead with Jake Ferguson, okay. tight end from uh, Wisconsin. Nice. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was the name I kind of had circled there was Williams, um, just based on what I had read about him um, in general. And then your point there that it seems like there's going to be opportunity with some of the, the splashier stuff playing alongside Micah and all that. Mm -hmm. very cool um all right so cowboys reportedly worth 10 billion dollars jerry's not selling them are you surprised any thoughts no nah. um you know i heard an interview probably about uh three or four years ago ddp and it was stephen jones he was talking and one of the things he was saying he was like you know i hope you guys really love the joneses because we're not ever going anywhere mm -hmm. now once i heard that i never thought anything else again because i knew they were never selling it but when i heard stephen jones say it, the way he said it it was just like, yeah, they're going to go to their graves with the Joneses owning the team. And, uh, you know, I mean, it is what it is. I can't feel any kind of way because I know this is what it is. The Jones are never not going to be. Um, but it does, in my opinion, feel a little disheartening because I, I just don't feel like they're going to win a Super Bowl anytime soon. I felt like last year was one of the best opportunities, and I was still pessimistic because of the playoffs. Yeah. Um, I was nervous about them. Um, but, yeah, I don't feel good about it because I feel like Dallas is not going to win a championship anytime soon, no matter what talent they have. Just my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, the Jerry thing, not being willing to sell the team. It, it doesn't surprise me at all. I mean, especially if you're already a billionaire, what does $10 billion more really do for you? Like, Jerry's already up there in age, so it's just like, to him at this point, like, that is his notoriety. Is that like, yeah. Jerry, in his mind, mm -hmm. he is the Cowboys. Yeah. So he would have nothing to do. It'd be like, exactly. You, you he would those, die. Yeah, exactly. I was just about to say, you have those people who like work all their lives and then they retire. And it's like within a couple of years, they die. And it's, mm -hmm. it's almost like they just don't have anything else to do, nor their identity or anything. And they just kind of like, and I just kind of slowly power down. Yeah. That, that's what it seems like would happen with Jerry in that case. Anyway, not to put that in the universe, but it's not going right. to matter anyway. Cause like we said, he's not going to sell no matter what, especially because right. at his age, $10 billion more doesn't mean anything when he's already worth billions. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Uh, what is the, all right. So for this upcoming season, we're going to get into that and the particulars a little bit more in a second. What is the best win you predict? What is the worst loss? Uh, best win is at green Bay. Yeah. I feel like we finally slayed that dragon um, against the green Bay Packers. I feel like uh defense, that's the defensive game where we're really going to turn up and, uh, you know, really just have a lot of give Aaron Rodgers a lot of problems. So that's going to be my best. Uh, my worst is going to be the Philadelphia Eagles. I feel like they're, we're going to lose to the Eagles, um, at Philly. Um, and it's going to be a game that I'm not going to like, 
um, and they're going to feel really good about themselves, feeling like they're uh, they're back and they're going to mm-hmm. win the East. Uh, so that's why I don't. That's why it's that game because it's right after the Rams game. I feel like we lose a heartbreaker some kind of way in that Rams game. Not that they were better than us, it's just a heartbreaker. And then just uh, it lingers on to the next game. It's a night game. It's at Philly. They're going to be going crazy. Yep. I just feel like it's going to be one of them games. They're going to be smelling themselves. Yeah, I can see that for sure. So that brings us then into our final segment here Cowboys schedule prediction. So we got, uh, I'll, we'll go rapid fire on this a little bit. We can elaborate on it and all that, but I'm going to lay out the schedule point by point. You just say win or loss, and then we can circle back. Or if there's something key in that, like you, you just gave the context of why the Philadelphia game at Philadelphia is a bigger deal. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. We can we can touch on that. So week All right, one, let's do it. Week one versus Tampa Bay, <clears throat> loss. Agreed. <clears throat> week two versus Cincinnati. Ooh, I've been going back and forth with this one because I know we can beat them, but I just feel like loss. I actually say win, and I actually relating to our previous segment, I think it's considered the best win of the season because mm-hmm. they still have the shine of the Super Bowl contender. Uh, you know, nearly won the Super Bowl, and I feel like it's just going to be the thing that just sparks the hype train on the Cowboys again. Like, ooh, they just beat, you know, Cincinnati while they still have all that shine on that apple and right, everything. Right. And that's going to get people fired up, and then the Dallas is going to turn around, and whether it's the next game against the Giants or Washington, they're going to smell themselves too much, and they're going to fall on their face for no reason. Week three at New York Giants. Oh, win. Yep, I got that as a win as well. Week four versus Washington Commanders. Still gonna definitely take a minute to get win. used to that. You got that yeah, as a win? Yeah, we definitely got a win. I got that as the fall in their face. Ooh. Mm-mm. Um, I didn't say the worst loss. I said the fall in their <laughs> face that I just referenced, which actually should be an <laughs> ominous thing that I'm saying. Um, mm-hmm. Week five at Rams. Heartbreaker loss. I agree. The fact that it's on the road makes me think loss for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, week six at Philadelphia. Uh, um, loss earlier. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 the ugly loss. Yep, I agree. I, I have that one in my mind. I view that as a blowout. Mm-hmm. Uh, week seven versus Detroit. Oh, we're gonna smash them. Yep, week eight versus Chicago. Uh, that's gonna be a tough game for some reason. I feel like, but uh, I feel like Justin Fields is gonna act weird, but we're gonna get him. We're beating them. I got that as a win as well. Uh, then we got the buy in week nine, week 10 at Green Bay. You said that was the best win. I, oh, have, yes. I have that as a loss. They will never slay the dragon of Aaron Rodgers, <laughs> just like they never slayed the dragon of Tom Brady, even though he came back and has given them another shot. Mm-hmm. Um, then we got week 11 at Minnesota. When? I've, I've gone back and forth on this one, uh, literally over the course of the day, looking at my... We my own Kirk sheet. Cousins. We yeah, own Kirk Cousins. True, true. But I feel like we got away with... Uh, house money you know we kind of got away with one last year not even playing Dak and then you have the uh because we got their number down Cooper Rush to Amari Cooper yeah I could see that but I feel like going there twice in a row is going to be hard um Mm -hmm. coming out both times with a win but I do have it as a win the most Uh recent draft of this I have as a win Mm -hmm. uh week 12 versus the Giants oh win I got that as well I think the Giants are still a ways away uh, week 13 versus Indianapolis. Uh, win. Okay, I got that one down as a loss right now. Mm-hmm. Um, week 14 versus Houston. Win. Yep. 15 at Jacksonville. Win. And 16 at uh, versus Philadelphia, excuse me. Oh, definitely win. That's where we come back and I smack th- down. I think that's the bounce back game against Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. Yep. 17 at Tennessee. Loss. Loss. And 18 at Washington. We're going to beat them, but that's going to be a tough one. I think that's going to be a very tough one. I do have it down as a win, though. So, uh, so what I have for my record, um, I think kind of like you had one more win, I think, than I did. Um, so that would mean you have 11 and 6 then? I, I got 12 and 5. You got 12 and 5. Okay, so I missed mm-hmm. another one then. You got 12 and 5. Uh, are you owing that mostly to the fact that they are – tied for the second weakest record do you think that just opens the door for them i i think it does because if you really look at the teams that they play especially with the east the east is not tough um so that's that's giving you a victory is easy mm-hmm. to me victories right there 
And then just toward the end of the schedule, after the Green Bay, I feel like it Minnesota, Giants, Indianapolis. I do have I mean, some rhythm for them around that time, yeah. You, you know what I'm saying? I feel like this is where they catch fire, and I feel like they're catching fire because they get that big victory at Green Bay. Mm-hmm. And once they get that big victory at Green Bay, they, you know, they're feeling themselves, they're feeling good, and that's when they go on that roll. It's possible, but I do remember um... – it was 2018. I'm trying to remember exactly. I think they had that 13-10 win at home against the Saints and then went the next week to Indianapolis and just got Trailer Park smacked. Mm-hmm. I think they make up for this. I feel like they yeah. remember that game, and I think that's why they beat them. And I mean, it's at home. 2018's both forever ago and not so long ago. For guys like Dak, yeah, they would remember that. But I do feel like there's been a fair bit of turnover since then. So I don't know. I hope that they would be ready and up for that, but I don't know. Uh, so I have 10 and 7. The team hasn't won 10 games in back-to-back seasons in the mid-90s. That said, I think they get it this year because of the fact there's an extra game. <laughs> I think mm-hmm. that's the reason they get there with 10 and 7. I have 4 and 2 in the division, splitting with Washington. Again, um, That's I-, I think that's really the bad loss that I have on them. Um. Yeah, I, I basically have the Washington. Um, I, I noted it as Washington. But basically losing a game against one of the lesser division teams that they should not lose. And I think it's one of those things that it will, it's not going to hurt them winning the division, but as far as like playoff seating, I think it's going to come back to haunt them. Kind of like in 2019, that loss at the Jets that people just couldn't figure out what the hell happened. And then they end up having to basically play for the their season there uh, in Philadelphia in the final the finale and it doesn't go so well for them. I think it's going to be one of those things where it's like it kind of bites them a little bit. Again, I don't think it costs them the division. I just think it gives them a tougher road in the playoff matchup they might draw and uh that'll be something people look back on it. Uh yeah, we sweep or sorry, sweep of the Giants split with the Eagles. Yeah, I just got them losing that one loss in the East. I feel like they still control it. Maybe Washington gets better because of Carson Wentz. I think they do get a few more victories, just not against Dallas. I feel like we still kind of just got their number. Mm-hmm. Along with the Giants, too, I feel like, you know, they got some good draft picks, but they still uh, some time away. I feel like it, it, Philadelphia, they gotten better. I mean, I said they it on my Twitter really today. Uh, really aggressive offseason, uh, pretty good draft, even though they got rid of some picks that the picks the, that they did get were quality picks, especially yep. for that defense. Uh, they really stacked up that defense, so – um, really, it's on uh, Jalen Hurts, in my opinion. Um, yep. Same way that uh, it, to me, it's the same thing with Dak Prescott is way with Jalen Hurts. Uh, I feel like a lot of people over there in Philly are, are wanting to see if he's really the guy, and he's got to really prove that he is the guy. And they gave him weapons; they're giving him no excuses. Yep. And this is his year to see. And uh, if he doesn't, I feel like they get rid of him. They got two first round picks, and that's when they agree. go to quarterback. You know what I'm saying? So. Yep. Um, we're going to see this year. So it's going to be a lot of pressure. And because of that pressure, I feel like that's why they're going to come real. They did a lot of this all season for Dallas, dog. Let's just keep it real. Yeah. No, I, I agree. Uh, this is this is going to be the no excuses year, put up or shut up for Jalen Hurts. And I, I think um, the only quarterback I think in a similar situation probably is what, Tua in Miami. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the only guy I can really think of that's in a similar kind of situation. Like, okay, we're giving you everything. Either show us you're the guy or we're going to look to move on. And Philadelphia still has the assets to go try and find that guy. So, yeah, I, I do really like what Philadelphia has done, whether it was the, the draft. Um, I love how aggressive they are. Like, I hate yeah. saying that. I don't want to compliment Philadelphia for anything. but Not right. Uh, I hate the fact that you got to You got to give them was... props, though. Sure. I mean, they, sure. they don't stand pat. They sit there. They watch what's going on. They said, OK, hey, uh, we got a new coach. Uh, we made the playoffs with this new coach. We want to. We're not going to stay pat. You feel what I'm saying? We're yep. not going to stay pat and stay where we're at. We're not satisfied with what we did last year just because we made the playoffs with the new coach. We're not going to sit there and rest on our laurels and sit there and say, "Oh, we're just happy that we made it there." Mm-hmm. And we'll see what happens next year. No, we're going to go all in again, and we're going to try to go ahead and take this division. And we're and when they did that approach in 2017, they went to the Super Bowl, dog. So that's all. Yep. I mean, that's all I can say. <laughs> yeah. No, that and that's that's what I'm saying. Like. I love how aggressive they are on stuff. They're never satisfied. Now, sometimes it blows up, right? You like the mm-hmm. the experiment where they had Vince Young and uh, Michael Vick, and Young says like, "Oh, it's the 
what do you say, like the world's greatest team or the something? Mm -hmm. I forget the exact phrase, but that that was a dumpster fire for them. But like they made several moves that summer where you were like, "Ooh, dang, Philadelphia is going for it." Mm -hmm. They they do this kind of thing, like you do this Mm -hmm. regularly, and then you'll have. Mm -hmm. After the Super Bowl, you had a couple years there that were lean, and people were like, oof, they kind of lost their pulse on this. Now you flash forward another year or so, and it's like, ooh, they're, they they're right back at picks. it. Ooh, yep, that's yep. a lot of really good picks that they got. Oh, and they went and got this receiver, and they got this guy. And like, you see it, and you just see a willingness to wheel and deal that the Cowboys just don't have. Like, I know Jerry had that in him for the longest time, but Jerry used to just go try to money whip the team. But uh, at Philadelphia, in this case, like, they've They've done a little bit of that too, but like, I love the aggressiveness with just looking at every aspect of their team and where they can get better. And I feel like too often with Dallas, it's just like, no, 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 we don't want to pay guys um, unless it's our own guys that we've already had in house for a while. Right, right. And you know, we're just gonna keep going back to the draft and keep turning back. If they had drafted Amari Cooper, they would not have gotten rid of him. That's my hot take. Hmm. Well, you know what? You know what, DDP? Here's like I, I, I keep saying this through all the streets and all the Twitter streets, the football streets, whatever. It's so funny how Stephen Jones operates yep. because he never wants to gamble with a, a, a free agent because I don't know if it's the brand of car you got burnt thing. You just want to mm-hmm. stack the bread. Uh, but you never want to gamble on guys that have already proven their worth. They have shown out there and proven what they are, are capable of and helping your team. That's why they have them out there. OK, but you always want to go to the draft and that's a huge gamble, too. Yep. So you don't want to gamble in free agency only because you don't want to spend that money. You're taking just a big of a risk in the draft because these guys are coming from college to the NFL and they never played it down yet. Mm-hmm. But because they are cheaper, you're willing to take that risk because you can get rid of it and you don't have to be crying about that cap because that's what it really is with this dude. And because it is with this dude. I feel like conservative don't win. So, yeah, I, I'm going to say it time and time again. Dallas is going to win games. Dallas going to be competitive. Dallas going to have talent. But Dallas ain't going to get over the hump. And as mm-hmm. long as he's in that conservative mindset that he stays in, Philadelphia will have the chance to leap us because of the aggressiveness. I've seen people saying, oh, they got James Bradbury. He gave up this. He gave up that. James Bradbury is still a quality corner. It's not like they yep. got a bum. OK, and so they paired him with Darius Slay. That's a formidable duo. Nobody said it. it's a all star duo, but it's formidable and it's going to give try to give you problems. And they did it because they want to stop our offense. So that's smart. And if you did it for a one year, nine million dollar deal. Yeah, that's saying we're going to do this for a year because we're going to go all in. We don't know if we're keeping you after this. You might want to want too much money. But for this year, let's try to get it. That's why wouldn't you do that? Yeah, no, 100% agree. Uh, Their mentality is dead on the money of, I I think, how you have to approach this. And uh, Dallas, they're they're just kind of caught in that middle ground. They don't want to let something like the 2015 season, I mean, that took injuries for that to come together. They don't want to be a four-win team or a team at the bottom of the deck that, you know, actually is in position for the high end draft picks so as a result if you don't have top 10 talent you might still be able to find good players that can make your team better but i feel like you're oftentimes not always obviously micah parsons fell to you cd lamb fell to you but you're oftentimes in a situation where you're just not able to turn it around and you're not able to get the the real impact difference made for it so yeah um it's it's a tough deal but i i feel like i'm there with you the cowboys are long as they're staying in their own way which doesn't look like it's changing anytime soon they're just going to be content with right raking in money and being okay not great being competitive yep. that's it yep that's it speaking of uh competitive <laughs> this warriors defense right now is downright, yeah, downright all smothering over. and mm-hmm. they're they took a nine point game and just blew it open they're up 17 now in the blink of an eye wow that was uh, that was impressive. Just that last couple minutes. Yeah, I, like I said, man, they they they. I seen the approach that they kind of coming with, and uh, like I said, they're we just talked about how they're hedging super hard. They're not letting they they made a point uh, to go after Jalen Brunson. They made a point to go after him, and uh, like I said, put they were putting um, 
uh, the big kid, uh, the seven footer on him, yeah. uh, you know, just to, to, to stop his shot. Yep. Um, so it was a smart way. So the cow, uh, I said the Cowboys, the Mavericks, Jason Kidd. Um, this might be one of them games where you just you, you just said it twenty and two. You might this might be the ass whooping that you just took on game one, and you just go look at the tape and uh, let's make those adjustments uh, and yep. see what they're doing to us, and let's hit game two and let's steal one out of there. Yeah, because uh, they they had made a run earlier on. Golden State they love third quarter runs, like they'll blow the game open top of the third quarter. And that's basically what just happened there. Hitting threes, Curry hit like two or three threes in there. And then Luka got ripped twice. Once The second time, I think Dallas recovered it and at least kicked out for a good look at a three they missed. Jalen got ripped once. Um, Draymond, his rip of Luka was brilliant. Not even guarding him straight up. Just saw him driving in the lane. Just got a hand in there and just stripped it clean. That's uh that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. If Draymond is making a bunch of plays like that, it's going to be difficult for Dallas. But they just got to get one. It might it's not likely to be game one. It wasn't game one against Phoenix. If you're Dallas though, you can't just have the mindset of like, well, hey, we came back from O two. That's a good mindset for staying motivated. If you find yourself down O two again, it's not so great if you're going in saying like, ah, eh, whatever, we can lose this one because we we've shown we can come back. Like if you're in that. Uh, that mode, that mindset where you're just kind of like accepting of like, all right, well, this one's not happening. Then you're not going to, you're not going to pull this out. It's a, uh, we'll see. We'll see how they respond. There's literally nine twenty nine left in the third quarter, but uh, they went from down nine to open the quarter to down 17, 64, 47, right? Brutal. Yeah. I kind of felt like it was going to be one of these games anyway. You know, I just, you know, you never want to just sit there and say your team's going to lose game one. Sure. I just, but just had that feeling. I just had this going to be that first tough game where they're going to be playing crazy. The crowd's all in it during the Western Commerce finals. It's nutcase. It's uh, the one thing about Golden State, they are a faithful crowd. Uh, I think they had uh, sold out for like, I think they were one of the top arenas that were sold out for so many years straight. And they weren't having good teams. So that's a faithful bunch over there. So I knew it was going to be rushes. I was kind of uh, saying that this is probably going to be the that game one loss. Um, but like I said, take everything in, Jason Kidd, and your um, coaching staff. See what they really did to you today. And uh, see so you can go ahead and make those adjustments. Yep, 100%. Got a, hopefully a long series ahead of us here. But we'll see. I think that brings us to the end of what we had covered here. If, is there anything else you wanted to touch on or are we, what do you think? No, I'm good, man. Just, yep. you know, just uh, let's get ready. You know, let's, we going to, uh, do we, are we going to tell them about surprise that we're going to be doing something next week and that we haven't been doing? I mean, I... yeah. So I think the plan, we're going to run it live for the first mm-hmm. time for positively relentless. We're going to run it live next Wednesday. So um, being there deep. Yep. Yep, we were talking about doing it today, and then I realized, like, wait a minute, the game's tonight. Nobody's <laughs> going to be watching, or if they not are, one, or if maybe they are one. in the chat, they're going to be like, "Why aren't the hell? Why aren't you talking about just the game? Why are we talking about exactly?" Life? And that's understandable. <laughs> I get it. I get it. But we are, yeah. we are like, a, I think of this sort of like a podcast that doubles as a as a YouTube show. At, right. So right. We uh we talk about the the latest going ons within the last few days for Cowboys and Mavericks. And we kind of build out from there. But yeah, so we'll be live next week uh, running on. I, I think we'll try and set it up if you want. Where we'll run live on both because um, I think the Mavericks thing is so hot right now. It'd be worth trying to get the prospect crowd in there as well. Right. But uh, yeah, we'll be doing that. I don't know how often we'll do live shows of this. I, I do. There's Just stay tuned. Just stay yeah, tuned. There's absolutely value me? in it, but I don't want it to be something where we're pulled off topic too often and too regularly by, you know, questions in the chat and stuff like that. Like it can be very helpful. And it can also be very distracting. Mm-hmm. We shall see. Uh, well, Oh, well, but Hey, so just get ready folks. It's about to be a big thing. Like I said, we may not go live all the time, but when we do, make sure you deep Wednesday, be deep up in there, check the video out, mark it on your calendar. Don't don't you forget about it. And of course, we're going to talk some more Cowboys football. Maybe something might happen. Dalton Schultz, they talked about in the back end, and they might be doing a long-term deal. We'll see what happens with that. So we always got some Cowboys football to talk about. 
Hopefully we're talking some good Mavericks jumping back in here and getting some dubs. And we'll be definitely talking to you guys next week live here on Positively Relentless EP4. This is Big Game James, DDP. We'll talk to you. We out. Peace.